What is going on, everybody? My name is Zella Prince, and welcome back to yet another reaction. And today, I finally bring you guys The War of Iraq. It is a documentary video I've been wanting to make for a while, and just never found anything good to check out. But since I started watching The Arm Hair Historian not that long ago, I looked a little bit on his channel and I found a full documentary video detailing the Iraq War. And if you guys are a long term viewer of the channel, and if you're not, please subscribe because I have more videos coming out in the future. Um, I know absolutely nothing about the War of Iraq. So. A lot of information is going to be thrown at me that I'm going to be paying close attention to. So, with that truly being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and get right into this video. I'm not going to delay any further. In three, two, one, go. Here we go. It is April 10th, 2003. F-16 fighters scream to life on a nearby tarmac while C-130 cargo planes are loaded up with supplies. A handful of soldiers play cards on a makeshift table, trying to distract <coughs> themselves from the anxiety in the air. They are American, British, Australian, and Polish. All are exhausted by the law. Okay, this is something I did know about the invasion of Iraq, that there were, there was a coalition of several countries involved, and not just the United States. That is something I did know. But to the extent, I have no idea. Long approach to the capital, but they know that the fighting is not over yet. As another plane departs for Baghdad, the Australian announces Royal Flush and lays down his cards. The others groan. He's won, but this is no ordinary game of poker. On each card, the face of a high-ranking Iraqi official is printed. They include generals, ministers, and, on the ace of spades, the president himself, Saddam Hussein. It is useful for the soldiers to familiarize themselves with these men. Soon enough, oh. they'll be hunting them. Huh. I didn't think that was something they did back then. Hi, I'm Hello. Griffin Johnson, the armchair historian. Today, we will be covering the 2003 invasion of Iraq, sometimes referred to as the Second Gulf War, which saw hundreds of thousands of troops committed to an invasion that ended with the deposition of a dictator. While we will cover... By the way, for those of you that don't know, I was two years old when this invasion started. <laughs> ...some of the political background and context of this much-discussed conflict this video will primarily focus on the combat, maneuvers, and objectives of the momentous invasion that sparked an eight-year occupation and insurgency. But first, if you haven't had the chance to check out our video on the first Iraq War, here is a quick recap. Oh. You know what? In the future, I will go check it out. So, I'll check out the first uh, Gulf War. After it ended with Iraqi... And since this is a recap, I'm not going to understand this completely until I watch the other video he made, so I'll have to check that out after I make this. ...forces being expelled from Kuwait, the U.S. soldiers sought to protect Kurdish and Shiite minorities in Iraq by enforcing no-fly zones and launching airstrikes against strategic sites such as oil fields and military bases. But following Saddam Hussein's repeated refusal to cooperate with UN weapon inspectors, the United States passed the Iraqi Liberation Act, which officially solidified the goal of regime change in the country. At the time, though, this act simply consisted of providing millions of dollars to numerous opposition groups in the country, with the hope of toppling Saddam's government. But as it turned out, America's interventions in the middle- Centered. YouTube restriction cannot discuss educational topics or comedic representation of foreign terrorist organizations or drug, tra drug, drug trade organizations content featuring fleeing imagery related to these groups. Uncensored so version can be found on- Oh, okay, so there is going to be censored parts. ...least had already sown the seeds of a new conflict. After the shocking events of- President George W. Okay. Bush stood before a wounded nation and officially declared that a new war was about to commence. A war on 
War on Terror. Unlike previous conflicts, America would now use preemptive force against any governments suspected of consorting with organizations, especially in accordance with what would be remembered as the Bush Doctrine. Within weeks, US forces had begun tearing apart Afghanistan in pursuit of Laden. But when the infamous- Which it, he's talking about the invasion of, Af of, Af of Afghanistan, <laughs> which is a video I already reacted to, so go check that out. Mastermind of the when attacks slipped away, the US turned its attention from Afghanistan to Iraq, where for the past 12 years, Saddam Hussein had increasingly been perceived as a threat to American geostrategic interests in the region. This wasn't helped by his refusal to cooperate with the United Nations. How are you doing? In late 2002, the United States began building a case against the Ba'athist government of Iraq and sought the support of the UN Security Council. On top of the claimed ties to Al-Qaeda, the Bush administration had a laundry list of justifications for armed intervention, including the mistreatment of civilians and the aforementioned expulsion of UN weapons inspectors. Perhaps foreseeing how controversial these accusations would be in the future, many in the UN Security Council strenuously objected to the proposed invasion, insisting that America pursue a diplomatic solution instead. But even while the council debated, CIA teams were landing in Iraq to lay the groundwork for a full-scale invasion. The US had already made- That is something else I did learn recently from what I have heard on and off about the invasion of Iraq, that there were con a lot of controversies, and it was a very controversial war from what I've heard. I'm going to find out why. Saddam's regime was doomed. Moving quickly, members of the Special Activities Division oh, established- Lil Griff, the Peshmerges, or those who face death, or guerrilla, oh, guerrilla forces operating in Kurdistan who oppose the Iraqi regime. Many Saddam's war, many of Saddam's war crimes were targeted at, at them. Contact with the Kurdish Peshmerges right who mm -hmm. opposed Saddam. Then they began identifying key elements of Iraqi leadership. This intelligence would be used to devastating effect in the opening days of the conflict, with surgical airstrikes killing many high-ranking officers. Additionally, the Special Activities Division captured a chemical weapons factory, yet despite Secretary of State Colin Powell's vivid descriptions of mobile weapons laboratories on the backs of trucks and train cars, the facility was the only one of its kind found during the entire Iraq War. Unsurprisingly, these preemptive strikes did not help America's case to the UN, which continued to call for de-escalation. Key NATO members, such as France and Canada, were also highly vocal in condemning America's aggression. Opposition around the world mounted, culminating with the largest recorded protest in human history when on February 15, 2003, over 6 million people in 800 cities gathered to protest the war. Nevertheless, Ow. in March of 2003, the United States and the Coalition of the Willing, which included the United Kingdom, Poland, and Australia, among others, began massing troops in the region. Unlike the war fought 12 years earlier, they would be advancing without UN approval. Yeah. The invasion began slowly. The first phase consisted of numerous airstrikes and covert raids on targets within the country, with varying degrees of success. One of the first of these was the Battle of al Qaim on March 17th, when units of the British Special Air Service attacked a suspected chemical weapons site housed in a water treatment facility near the Syrian border. But the Iraqi defenders put up an unexpectedly spirited defense, and the commando team was forced to withdraw under heavy fire. Frustrated, they called in an airstrike leveling the entire facility and obliterating any potential evidence that chemical weapons were being held in the facility. Another strike occurred two days later at a community. So that was another reason why the United States, well, the coalition went in was because of the assumption of, of chemical weapons not being recorded. Just outside Baghdad called Dura Farms. Believing that Saddam was visiting his sons in the area, the United States saturated the area with 8,000 pounds of ordnance and 40 Tomahawk cruise missiles in an attempt to wipe the Iraqi dictator off the face of the earth. 
It However, every single satellite-guided warhead missed its target, and as a result, over a dozen civilians were injured and one killed. To complete the debacle, it was later discovered that Saddam's last visit to the area had been nearly a decade ago. Wow. Despite these issues, the main invasion was finally getting underway. Based on the precedent set in the first Gulf War and Afghanistan, most observers had expected a lengthy period of aerial bombardment before any ground offensive. However, the coalition instead opted to launch a rapid air and ground campaign that would avoid most urban areas and focus on decapitating the Iraqi government. This tactic, later called shock and awe, was chosen for two reasons. So, First, so that's where that term comes from. I've heard it a couple of times, but I just never knew the origin of where it started. First, American leaders assumed that if the command structure was eliminated, organized resistance would disintegrate. Second, it was hoped that the civilian population would support the Americans as liberators. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld was particularly optimistic about this, stating, there will be Iraqis who offer not only to help us, but to help liberate the country and free the Iraqi people. As we will see, this wasn't totally the case. No, On the not of all March of them 19th, Ooh, members of the 160th Airborne, known as the Night Stalkers, destroyed more than 70 Iraqi military outposts along the southern and western Wait, how border. how many? More than 70 Iraqi military outposts along the southern Yeesh. and western borders. That's With a lot of bases clear, lost. Coalition forces advanced from Kuwait in two prongs, one directed north and one south. A combined air and amphibious assault was also launched on the Al Fa Peninsula on March 20th, with the Wait, goal that to say? assault. Since any member of state Turkey refused to allow American troops to enter through their border in the north, coalition forces instead launched from Kuwait. Oh, was also launched okay. on the Al Fa Peninsula on March 20th, with the goal of securing the critical oil infrastructure located there. American, British, and Polish commandos all worked tirelessly to capture the offshore. I forgot a video. A video I've watched recently about uh, Poland didn't mention quite a lot that Poland was indeed involved with the invasion of Iraq. That is from an infographic video I watched, I think, a few months ago when it came out. Forms before they could be sabotaged by the defenders. Despite significant resistance from entrenched Iraqis supported by artillery fire, the teams were able to secure the peninsula after a grueling three-day battle. Only three days? Their efforts likely prevented a major ecological disaster and saved billions of dollars worth of equipment that Saddam would otherwise have destroyed in a petty act of revenge. Yeah. What was with the speedboat? Unfortunately for the coalition, this would be the last bit of good PR they would receive for quite some time. As we'll see in the part two, which is out right now, the war for Iraq was just beginning. Oh yeah, I forgot this video was multiple parts, but this is the entire video. And even this initial taste of victory had been soured by the clumsy handling of Al Qaim and the disaster at Dura Farms. While coalition casualties remained minimal, intelligence failures would continue to plague future operations, muddying the overall picture of the war in Iraq to such an extent that many details remain unclear to this day. Mm. Or maybe it wasn't several videos. The first major engagement together. began on March 23rd, when a maintenance convoy of the 3rd U.S. Infantry Division took a wrong turn into Nasiriya, right into the headquarters of the Iraqi 3rd Corps. Caught in a hastily uh -oh. prepared ambush, 15 of the- Among these casualties were Lori Pestua, the first Native American woman to die while serving the U.S. Army, and Jessica Lynch, who recovered- whose recovery a week later was highly publicized. 18 vehicles were destroyed by heavy mm. weapons fire, and 18 U.S. soldiers were killed or captured. But the strategic bridges over Nasiriya's modestly named Saddam Canal were secured later that day after men from the 2nd Marine Division stormed the city, suffering heavy casualties from the determined Iraqi defenders. As if the intense urban combat wasn't enough, six Marines were also killed in a friendly fire incident when an A-10 Warthog mistakenly oh. attacked their amphibious vehicle. 
finally, on the evening of March 24th, the Marines... Yeah, there's, there's, in the middle of the state of war, there's always a slim chance of friendly fire. No matter who you are, it always happens. There's always friendly fire. Even if it's like a one-off, there's always going to be it once every now and then. This broke through and established a perimeter north of the city, which Hard held to identify off despite multiple counterattacks by Iraqi forces and the Fedayeen Saddam militia, who were fanatical not only about Saddam, but apparently also about Darth Vader. Further north wait, was wait, the wait, go back. attacks by Iraqi forces and the Fedayeen Saddam militia, who were fanatical not only about Saddam, but apparently also about Darth Vader. Further north was the town of Rajah, which get it. was situated close to highways leading to the important cities of Karbala and Baghdad. Due to its strategic location, coalition forces decided not to bypass Najaf and instead chose to isolate the town out of fears it could become a staging area for attacks against American supply lines. To accomplish this, the coalition needed to capture the bridges to the north and south of the town. Elements of the 1st Brigade combat team attacked the Northern Bridge, codenamed Jenkins, in the early hours of March 25th, but made slow progress until they linked up with reinforcements before dawn. The Americans eventually fought their way across the bridge, despite desperate attempts by Iraqi engineers to destroy it. Around the same time, do it US time. forces advanced on the Southern Bridge, codenamed Objective Floyd. Resistance by both regular military and militia forces was intense at both sites. On one occasion, an Iraqi drove a city bus at full speed into an M3 Bradley CFV. Was it just him on in March the bus? On March 26th, Najaf was successfully encircled, and the attackers were relieved by the 101st Airborne. Over the next several days, the Americans swept through the town with tanks and infantry. The 101st deliberately left a single road out of the city open in the hope of using it as a kill zone for escaping troops. On April 1st, some of exactly the Iraqi soldiers took the bait and were ambushed by snipers and helicopter gunships, and the city ultimately Ow. fell on April 4th. To the south, British forces had an unexpectedly difficult time taking Basra and its nearby port. Starting on March 27th, they whittled down the Iraqi garrison defending the valuable port over the course of two weeks. When they finally- On March 27th, British forces destroyed 14 Iraq tanks in the largest British tank battle since World War II? Okay. Gained control of the vital waterway. Only 11 Britons had died, while the Iraqis had lost some 40 to 50 times that number. When British armor finally rolled into the city, they were welcomed by jubilant locals, as predicted by U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. Unfortunately, however, the crowds quickly turned into mobs of looters. The final major engagement before coalition forces arrived in Baghdad was at the Battle of Karbala Gap, a roughly 25-mile or 40-kilometer long strip of land flanked by the Euphrates and Rizaza rivers. Iraqi commanders were well aware of the Gap's strategic importance and had placed two divisions of the elite Republican Guard to block the Americans' advance. However, Saddam Hussein's son, Qusay, severely weakened the defense by redirecting some of them to the north which proved to be a Ooh. fatal mistake. On April 1st, American troops broke through the gap, reaching- I didn't know his son was serving in the military. The Euphrates at the city of Musaib. Though several Iraqi armored divisions counterattacked on the night of April 3rd, they were driven back by aircraft and rocket fire, and the coalition held on to the important bridgehead. With the path to Baghdad forced open and victory on the horizon, a last bloody struggle for the capital began. While the Iraqi army had almost completely disintegrated at this point, the Ba'athist party militias holding the city did not hesitate to utilize underhanded tactics to slow the coalition. Okay, so the invasion itself, the ground invasion, started in March, and now we're in April. This is going by very quickly. In advance. After extended skirmishes with the defenders, Colonel David yeah, Perkins April now. launched a surprise thunder run of nearly 30 tanks straight into the city on April 5th. Once behind enemy lines, the column came under intense fire from militiamen disguised as civilians, but Perkins was able to identify their defensive positions and execute a fighting withdrawal. 
U.S. Marines then stormed the Diala Bridge on the eastern side of the city and advanced along the northern bank of the Euphrates. Aware that this flank was almost entirely undefended, the nervous troops fired on any car refusing to halt out of fear of suicide bombers. Amidst this carnage, Perkins led another thunder run into the heart of the capital on the 7th and rewarded himself by spending the night in one of Saddam's opulent palaces. <laughs> <laughs> After a final desperate defense by the militias, the city was finally captured on April 9th. There were some initial celebrations by Iraqi civilians, including widespread vandalism of statues and portraits depicting the now-defeated Saddam. However, as in Basra, massive waves of looting soon followed. That was, I did see images of people taking down. Son of Saint's statue. I just don't know when that occurred. I thought it would occur after the war was over. And continued until U.S. forces cracked down on offenders. But Saddam himself proved elusive and would not be captured for many months. Coalition soldiers would spend their time securing the occupation and searching for other high-value government officials that had escaped the invasion. But as the coalition searched for these officials, violence between Iraq's minority groups soon erupted and insurgents began to assemble. Uh -oh. Nonetheless, on May 1st, 2003, off the coast of San Diego, President Bush made a dramatic appearance. Landing on the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln, the former Air National Guard aviator wore a flight suit for his televised address in front of a national audience. Standing in front of an enormous banner reading, Mission Accomplished, he announced the end of major combat operations in Iraq. At the time, the proclamation seemed reasonable. The Iraqi military was in shambles, and Saddam Hussein had been reduced from an autocrat to a fugitive. But despite all appearances, the troubles were just beginning. For the next eight years, the coalition was engaged in a protracted counterinsurgency and suffered heavy casualties, while many thousands of civilians lost their lives. In 2003, the mission may have been accomplished, and the brief conventional phase of fighting was indeed finished. But much like in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq had only just begun. Yeah. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian, and in today's Okay, so it seems like the, this whole video was in different parts, released over the last couple of years, and he put them all into one video. So we'll be taking our second look at the controversial subject of the 2003 Iraq War. This time, however, we will be covering the events from the Iraqi perspective by exploring oh. how the Iraqi people reacted to the invasion and the subsequent occupation. You know, that is something I never thought of. By Western powers. We'll also look at the rise of extremism and sectarianism that occurred after President Saddam Hussein's regime was toppled and how all this set the stage for the many years of insurrections, civil war, and international intervention. It cannot be overemphasized how much of a shock the 2003 invasion was to the Iraqi people. Even when President George Bush gave Iraq his famous 48-hour ultimatum, Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein remained convinced that U.S. forces lacked the capacity to wage more than a limited military campaign against his country. Saddam and his generals were well aware of past American failures, such as the infamous Black Hawk Down incident during the Somali Civil War. Saddam yes. had also. I, rem I watched the movie on that, so I completely. So I'm caught up with what uh, the movie represented. But I need to look into the entire history behind it. Who studied the conflict in Vietnam and hoped to replicate the success of the North Vietnamese by bogging down any invasion with defensive attritional warfare. With graphic scenes of destruction plastered across American TV screens, Saddam expected popular opinion to quickly turn against the conflict until coalition forces withdrew in disgrace. Yet, as we will see, many factors conspired to doom the Iraqi war effort long before the first shots were fired. Chief amongst these factors were Saddam's legendary paranoia, which made men like Joseph Stalin seem completely sane by comparison. His direct <laughs> really? preparations for the war were greatly surpassed by his efforts to completely lock down the Iraqi populace, pouring huge resources into the state security apparatus and surveillance programs. 
Many of the intelligence organizations that Saddam created were in fact tasked primarily with spying on each other. Being late to the blame game was fatal, and so these <laughs> various agents uh, those accused of treason will be tortured extensively in order to extract confessions and implicate other conspirators that could then be fed into the cycle of ac accusation. Ah, so this man was really... Wow. ...agencies spent months merrily chasing phantoms and inventing elaborate conspiracy theories. Naturally, the sentence for being accused in this web of lies and intrigue was always the same death. Predictably, this insanity had a profound effect on the military readiness of the country. Saddam really? valued loyalty above all other traits and divided his forces into three groups based on their perceived trustworthiness. These were the regular army, the Republican Guard, and finally the Special Republican Guard, or SRG. Visits between officers of different army groups were forbidden. We never coordinated with the Republican Guard. I had no relation with any other units or fighting. And joint operations were unthinkable. One SRG commander recalled after the war, hmm. we never coordinated with the Republican Guard. I had no relation with any other units or fighting forces. No other units were ever Get allowed it. near our unit. No visits between other officers ever allowed. In Saddam's mind, the only possible reason two officers of differing units would ever want to talk to each other would be to discuss a coup. Yet, despite their highly dysfunctional leadership, the average Iraqi soldier strode into battle with a surprising degree of misplaced confidence. For years, the army was blasted with religious rhetoric, promising that the infidel Americans would soon fall before the sword of Islam. The prevailing attitude among the military was that the U.S. was a paper tiger, able to emit a terrifying roar, but incapable of enduring any serious losses. Since his successful coup in the late 1960s, Saddam Hussein had ruled Iraq at the head of the Arab Socialist Ba'athist Party, which functioned as the central government and controlled all aspects of state policy. Given his unusually long reign, an entire generation of Iraqis had grown up having experienced nothing but Saddam's dictatorship. So few could imagine a world without their tyrannical leader exercising absolute power over their daily lives. However, despite Saddam's oppression, it is surprising how outright hostile the average Iraqi citizen was towards their supposed American liberators. For 12 years, America was only ever known as the distant oppressor, raining terror from the skies via airstrikes and subverting Iraqi culture by funding insurrectionist movements. Meanwhile, the few natives who benefited from Western education experienced decades of villainization and dehumanization at the hands of the Ba'athist party, who painted them as traitors who sold out their own country for American petrodollars. Many Iraqis were further distrustful of America after its behavior during the Iran-Iraq War, when it had cheered Saddam on as an indispensable ally in the Middle East, only to turn on his regime as soon as he threatened American interests in Kuwait. Saddam's regime also possessed a natural air of legitimacy thanks to his close ties to Islam. This was due to his extensive program of mosque building throughout Iraq and decades spent manipulating his citizens into a state of unquestioning religious propaganda devotion. Even those Muslims that hated their dictator still viewed his regime as inherently preferable to a democratic state, especially one subject to degenerate Western influences. This was a concept that the U.S. was simply unaccustomed to dealing with and led to many problems further down the line. A second and arguably far more important factor that the U.S. failed to consider was the ideological divide between the two major branches of Islam, the Sunni and the Shia. The reigning Ba'athist party consisted primarily of Sunni Muslims, while the neighboring Iran had undergone a revolution in 1979 that resulted in the creation of a Shia-controlled Islamic Republic. Fearful of a similar revolution in Iraq, Saddam brutally oppressed his Shia subjects, excluding them from positions of authority and conducting mass executions whenever there was any hint of rebellion. But such tyrannical measures, while effective in the short term, served only to stoke the fires of sectarian violence that would blaze out of control almost from the moment that U.S. forces stepped across the border. 
Much of the chaos following the invasion could have been avoided had the invading coalition forces drafted a feasible plan for bringing stability in the wake of a regime change. Sadly, this was not the case, and civil disorder quickly became the order of the day, with Shia militant groups seeking vengeance on their former Sunni oppressors. Troubles peaked in the capital city of Baghdad, which fell into a state of virtual anarchy following its capture. Shopkeeper Mohammed Abbas, who had fled the city as the Americans approached, said, When I got back to Baghdad, it was not the city I had left just a week before. You saw people walking everywhere carrying looted goods. Nowhere could you see any sign of law and order. No police, no military, no government, nothing. Everything had collapsed. The feelings of betrayal amongst the civilian population perhaps reached their peak after the Al Tabul raid in early 2004, when US forces entered and ransacked a mosque whose imam had recently begun preaching anti-American rhetoric and providing bomb-making lessons to would-be insurgents. Although a large cache of weapons and explosives were uncovered during the raid, Muslims across Iraq were horrified by the images of the desecrated holy place, with furniture smashed and copies of the sacred Quran scattered across the floor. Yeah. To add in you did not mess with their religion. Don't do it. Don't. Insult to injury, the Americans offered no apology, instead merely publishing a list of the seized items and brushing off the affair as just another routine operation against Saddam's forces. Extremist clerics were quick to jump at this golden opportunity, decrying the occupiers as devils, whose sole purpose was to wage a war against the faithful of Islam. To aid this narrative, Terrorist and militia groups attacked coalition bases dressed as civilians, forcing American soldiers to treat everyone as a potential threat. This created a vicious cycle of mutual distrust, each act of bad faith on one side triggering retaliation by the other, which only led to further escalation. Given how volatile mm. the situation was, coalition forces quickly announced a provisional government to provide a peaceful transition to democracy. But when the members of the new Iraqi Governing Council were revealed, the public was shocked to discover that it consisted of 13 Shias and only 10 Sunnis, five of whom were Kurdish minorities. To the Americans, this was simply a matter of proportional representation. After all, the Shias were the majority. However, to the Sunni loyalists of Iraq, the sight of the coalition raising up a government led by Shiites and Kurds was proof that Saddam's anti-Western rhetoric had been right all along. Oh. The situation was not helped by the behavior of some opportunistic Shia who quickly stepped in to fill the void left by their Sunni counterparts. To quote Sunni government employee Abu Mustafa, all of these senior officials had simply vanished, and soon we began to see a new sectarian order. People claiming to be doing the bidding of the Shiite religious authorities began to fill the posts left open by the vanished Baathists. They began verbally abusing and firing Sunnis or anyone they distrusted. Fortunately for America, there was still one organization that had a solid plan for dealing with the rising tensions in Iraq, the CIA. In the aftermath of the invasion, the CIA was in charge of tracking down and capturing as many members of the former Iraqi intelligence agencies as possible. Their efforts eventually succeeded when they rounded up a huge cabal of Ba'ath Party loyalists, many of whom openly admitted to torture, murder, and various criminal activities. Having listened carefully to the various testimonies made against these men, the CIA quickly concluded that there was only one reasonable course of action, to immediately offer them their jobs back and rebuild the core of Saddam's police state from the ground up. What? The CIA rationalized this decision with the logic that- This new Iraqi National Intelligence Service would also be supplied with approximately $3 billion in funding and continues to serve America interests in 2020. Under Saddam, terrorist activity in the region had been kept to a minimum, and therefore there was nothing intrinsically wrong with his methods, only his goals. With all the worst aspects of the old regime now being restored by the very people claiming to be their liberators, the Iraqi people were finally pushed over the edge. An explosion of violence rocked the nation, and the capital city was divided up into warring Sunni and Shia suburbs. The occupiers could do little but watch as chaos engulfed the nation. Their efforts to help constantly roadblocked by radicalism of their own inability to understand Iraqi culture. This bitterness and mistrust created an atmosphere where coalition soldiers saw danger around every corner. 
The political vacuum left by Saddam's defeat also allowed many extremist organizations to gain a significant foothold in the Middle East, turning the country into a war zone between government forces and radical militias. By 2006, the violence had escalated into a full-scale civil war that saw the attempts of ethnic cleansing by both Sunnis and Shias, resulting in the displacement of several million people. To this day, Iraq remains one of the most unstable countries on Earth, with American forces being withdrawn in 2011, only to return in 2014 to combat the growing power of ISIS in the region. Faced with endless threats, both external and internal, the fragile democratic state, now ruling the nation, is constantly hamstrung by the meddling of foreign intelligence agencies and the deep, bitter divisions amongst its populace. But with ISIS finally losing its territory in the country in 2017, some still cling to the faint hope that Iraq may finally be regaining its footing as a modern nation. Even so, there is still much work left to be done. Wow. <laughs> okay. I know more now about the war of Iraq than I did initially. All I knew was bits and, bits and pieces, and that was just about the extension of what I knew. But now I know a little bit more to go off on, so I'll have to check out more documentaries in the future. Probably not on YouTube, obviously, but for the, for the channel. But I'll have to look into my own research in the, in the near future. And I'll have to check out the first Gulf War, too, because that is another war I know little to nothing about. So that being said, guys, hopefully you enjoyed today's reaction video, and I will see you in the future. Bye.